I was in college and I had a possessive um, boyfriend at the time and it started with little things. I like your hair when it's be better like this. Oh, I like when you wear these kind of jeans and you do it at first making your partner happy but then before you know it you're a different person. So it's not like this happens overnight where it's like you can't go out anywhere. No, it started with little things and then it, it, you don't even realize how big it's gotten. Well, what do we mean by coercive control? If you imagine that you're in a relationship with somebody or you have a family member um, and they're, they're controlling of every aspect of you, they might tell you what to wear, they might tell you when you can see friends or family members, control your finances. It's something that can lead to loss of self-confidence, loss of friends, loss of family, social isolation. Um, and it can lead to, to, to very traumatic emotional and psychological injuries. A lot of victims do not recognise that they're in an abusive relationship. A lot of um, women that we support believe that um, if the, the relationship's not physical, then they're not experiencing it's domestic not violence. Hello and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is Jim Clemente, former New York City prosecutor and retired FBI profiler. And today with me in the studio is... Laura Richards, criminal behavioral analyst and advocate and author and director and founder of Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service. And I'm Lisa Zambetti. I'm the casting director for Criminal Minds and Criminal Minds Beyond Borders. And I have a real interest in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. So today we have a very special episode that Laura did while she was away in London so, Laura, you want to tell us what it's about? I will. And it was a, a fantastic um, interview with someone called Professor Evan Stark, which those of us who work in the, the sector and have worked in the domestic violence field and stalking will know that he wrote the book on, or the seminal book, I should say, on coercive control. And he's actually American. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, charting sort of his career um, he really started out as a researcher, as an award-winning researcher, um, looking at cases involving battered women or abused women and children. And he's got a huge wealth of knowledge, having worked also in the UK in, in Essex, um, Essex University. And the book is seminal because it's the first time really that the, the term coercive control was used. Um, you can look it up. It's called Coercive Control, How Men Entrap Women in Personal Life. And I had the pleasure of sharing a stage with him in London at a big national conference um, on coercive control. And he was one of our advisors in the, mm. on the domestic violence law reform um, campaign. And Great. I think it's going to be you know, very interesting. And one of the things I really want to do is a, a follow up where we bring him back and he talks to, to all of us. Because I know that you'll have some interesting questions to ask, too, of him. Yeah, we can't wait to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so without further ado, here is Laura and Professor Evan Stark. Well, I'm here with Professor Evan Stark. I'm very lucky to be in Bury St Edmunds, a beautiful little place in Suffolk. And Evan has, is somebody who has done a huge amount, um, not just writing the seminal book on coercive control, but is a terrific speaker. I've just had the pleasure of, of listening to him um, at the Theatre Royal, and so I'm delighted that we're sat in a dressing room at the bottom of a theatre or in the basement of a theatre, and welcome to Real Crime Profile, Professor Stark. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, we're pleased to have you on. Dressing room with Judy Dench. <laughs> it doesn't get better than this. This That's is right. the, the dizzy heights of success, is it? Well, I was at Colchester, you know, I taught at Essex. Uh, oh, so you've been local to him. I know Burry very, very well. And, I did not know that. Uh, yes, this is my first stamping ground in England. I had a Fulbright here in the late 1970s. And actually, it was at Essex University that we first analyzed the data that became the foundation for a lot of the domestic violence research in the U.S. because it was at Colchester at, at Essex that we uncovered the then astounding fact that domestic violence was the leading cause of injury for which women sought medical attention. And at that time, no one had the slightest idea this was so. They thought auto accidents were far and away the leading cause of adult injury. And we showed not only was domestic violence more common than auto accidents, but more common than auto accidents, rapes, muggings, all combined. So at that point, it was, a, it was really an amazing and was shocked to us. I mean, we had no idea. It was an amazing uh, revelation and really helped put, in the U.S. at least, 
I'll put uh, domestic violence on the map. Wow, I didn't know that. So England sort of has a special well, yeah. resonance with you in terms of your career and your data analysis and really turned things on its head that way. And the reason, the reason Colchester, Essex, was such a wonderful place to work, and I was in the sociology department, because the British uh, sociologists that I was working with, they didn't seem to believe in data. So there was this poor uh, uh, research officer who was assigned to the sociology department, and he basically had nothing to do. So these crazy Americans, Ann Flitcraft and Evan Stock, brought over these mountains of data from Yale University. I was on a Fulbright at, at uh, Essex. The mountain of data. And, and we gave it to him, and he was like, he was so excited. And he spent the whole year doing nothing but analyzing our, our data with us. Wow. So it was very, very interesting. Yeah, so, so back up a little bit to uh, when you first started your career. In um, domestic violence. In domestic yeah. violence, and, and what sort of motivated you to do that? Well, before, uh, we, had come, uh, we had come to England uh, a few years earlier, uh, probably in the uh, early 70s, uh, in 1973, 1974. Uh, we had started a program in our community um, based on visiting the first battered women's shelter in the U.S. My friend Sharon Vaughan had started it in a place called St. Paul, Minnesota. And Sharon had taken her inspiration from Cheswick in London, Aaron Pitsy's uh, house. So uh, my wife Nan got a small little grant, and we came over and visited Cheswick House, visited Pitsy. Um, in fact, uh, we were with the women in Pitsy when we seized, when I left uh, Cheswick House and went to another section of London. Excuse me, you have to remember there were about 200,000 people squatting in London at that time. and. Uh, we went with this little bus that belonged to Cheswick House, and we seized an old railroad hotel. And we put up wallpaper, and we started another uh, battered women's refuge uh, in London. So that was very exciting. That's incredible. And that was it was incredible. And then we went back to the United States, and uh, within a few months, uh, had started um, hiding uh, women and their children in our homes. We had a small little group, uh, mostly of graduate students. Anne was my wife was a medical student. So we took women into our homes, and one of the most outstanding uh, memories that I have of that was, uh, and it really had a lot to do with my subsequent work on course of control, uh, was that one of the first women we hid in our house, she'd been hiding in a car for about two weeks with her nine-year-old daughter. And I remember, as if it were yesterday, asking her, well, uh, you know, talk about the violence, because that's how we understood uh, abuse. And she said, uh, the violence wasn't the worst part. Now, that has become a cliche now, but at the time, I didn't have any idea what she was talking about. And of course, my response at the time was, talk about the violence. Because I knew how difficult it was uh, for rape victims where we had done some work to do so. And it really took literally almost 30 years uh, of, of thinking and research, maybe a little less, 25 years, to get back to what that woman had said and make it the foundation of uh, the research and the, and the thinking and the writing that uh, I've been doing now for about 15 years. Yeah, and doing... A course of control, yeah. Doing all the lectures. And I know certainly, you know, we've had a lot of interest from our listeners because we've covered cases like Nicole um, Brown Simpson and Reva Steenkamp and cases where we've been talking about coercive control and a lot of people have been tweeting and emailing us, um, certainly a lot of victims coming forward who didn't identify uh, initially with some of the behaviours, um, a lot of professionals as well. And, you know, it still seems in some ways you've been living and breathing this for a long time, you know, as have I of 20 years working in, in this area, but it's still very new to many people, yeah. the notion of coercive control. I think one of the ironies uh, of the O.J. Simpson case was the disconnect between those of us who were working with women in, in the shelters and the refuges in America um, and the way in which the general public saw the case. I mean, to those of us who were, had been working uh, in the battered women's movement, starting shelters, you know, and so forth, there was nothing more transparent than the connection between the homicide and the long history of abuse and, and stalking and, you know, that O.J. Simpson had done. And yet, to the jury and to most of America, there was no connection. Mm. One of the jurors said after the uh, the not guilty verdict, when they interviewed her, what did you think about the domestic violence uh, in the case? She said, well, if they wanted to talk about domestic violence, they should have gone down the hall to domestic violence court, 
meaning a, a trivial misdemeanor court, somewhat akin to a traffic court. Whereas to those of us who understood the issue, uh, obviously this was an incredibly serious uh, and, and very classic uh, example of if I can't have you, no one will, which many women hear from batterers. So I think that case was very seminal uh, in making us realize the huge disconnect between uh, what was going on in women's lives, uh, abused women's lives, and the way the general public understood and, and understood it, and it, it, it really emphasized for us, uh, I think critically, uh, the long-term educational project that we had to go through in order to communicate uh, what women were telling us and what we were seeing in the refuges and the shelters in the U.S. Um, and what the general public uh, understood uh, about domestic violence. They saw it essentially as a second-class misdemeanor, somewhere akin to a traffic offense. Mm. And, of course, some places still see that. And I think certainly right. the reaction to the podcast has been creating that connection and telling stories about cases. And, and our whole ethos has been giving victims voices and certainly in Nicole's case, you know, we said that she had become a footnote in her own murder, that it became about OJ, it became about everything else other than about the victim Remember, in the history. it wasn't just her that was murdered. Well, and Ron Goldman, which we yes. talked about Ron a lot, and about his family and how instrumental they were, his father, you know, making sure that people understood that Ron was a victim too. Because they both seemed to just be completely written out of their own murders, which was incredible. Well, this was the disconnect that I'm talking about, that to every advocate in the United States, there was absolutely no question that if there was a homicide, if there was a history of domestic violence, there was about a 95% chance or more that the uh, killer was the person who had been abusing and controlling the victim. And of course, that was the case in, in mm. here. But to the rest of America, that connection simply had not been made. That was, that was not... Uh, that was not made. And the case came to symbolize a variety of other uh, uh, issues in our movement. Um, uh, so, and, and really that case, uh, for me, connected with some other, in, another uh, homicide case that I was involved in, uh, the huge gap between what, what the women we were working with experienced, what the men were doing in terms of harming these women and the ways in which the public and the police and the court systems understood domestic violence and as, a, as a crime. And it's that disconnect, that huge gap between what, the, what millions of women are experiencing um, and what the men were doing in those relationships and how the public was perceiving and how the criminal justice system was responding that really informed all of my research and my writing about course and control. It was designed to close that gap uh, in a way that um, would bring the law and the justice system uh, in concert with what the vast majority of women that we were uh, sheltering in our refuges um, in the United States and, and throughout the world were experiencing. And so you wrote the seminal book on coercive control, and, and I've got to say I've used it in many court reports. Oh, I've quoted you many times, in fact, in the Home Office, in the statutory guidance on the new coercive control law, I actually used, asked for one of your quotes to be put in there, because it's just so important for people to understand what coercive control is about and its connection with lethality. But hearing it from the expert's mouth, can you define, you know, having written the book, you know, what you would say coercive control is all about? As I heard, you know, you obviously on the platform, and I've heard you many times talk about it as a liberty crime. Right. And so many of our listeners, you know, and people who tweet us ask, you know, tell us exactly what you would see the definition well, as. Coercive control as a general pattern of behavior is not unique to the coercive control of women. You can have it in prison of war camps, you can have it in prisons. I mean, in general, all it means is that there's a combination of tactics that are used over time to subordinate someone um, and essentially through a pattern of threats of violence, violence, isolation, and other tactics, um, bend them to your will. Uh, and it could be in situations as like prisons where they, or prison or war camps where their uh, liberty is already compromised, or it could be in other situations. Um, as I use coercive control, I'm using it specifically 
with respect to this, uh, women's uh, entrapment in abusive relationships, almost always by abusive men. And I use it that way because I believe that the course, you know, I think we now have data to, uh, to support this belief, that the course of control of women by men is not only far and away the most common, but also the most devastating form of course of control. And the reason for that is not because men are intrinsically more controlling than women. I don't believe that for men. Um, or that even heterosexual relationships are more fertile ground for course of control than, for instance, same-sex relationships. Right. Um, but it's because of women's inequality uh, and the particular ways in which that inequality can be exploited in personal relationships by men that I think the course of control of women is so prevalent and so devastating. Um, so from my standpoint, course of control, first of all, it's a pattern of behavior. It's not an individual act. Uh, it's a pattern of behavior that extends over time, uh, which means it has a historical dimension. Uh, it also has a wide breadth. It involves a whole range of tactics. So that's part of the definition, the range of tactics. And while it may include violence, it doesn't always include violence. It may inc it include some forms of coercion, threats, um, intimidation, you know, of other sorts. Um, but in most cases, about 75% of the cases we estimate, there is a pattern of violence. Uh, and then it includes other tactics of coercion, uh, particularly intimidation tactics, the most prominent of which, as, as I'm sure you know, is stalking. But these intimidation tactics run the gamut from little th literal threats to kill to threats that, to the outside world, may even look like love. So the coercive part of it is the physical violence, the intimidation, and of course, very importantly, uh, and very uniquely, in terms of the male control of women, use of coercive control of women, the sexual abuse. Uh, as far as I know, there is no other kind of coercive control, uh, not men's control of other men, or women's control of men, in, in which the sexual abuse element plays nearly as significant a role as in the course of control of women uh, by men in heterosexual relationships. And, and by, and the, the, so, so that's a critical piece of it. Um, and then there are the controlling elements which complement the coercion and are designed essentially to take fear and deploy it in a process of subordination. Um, and, and the controlling tactics uh, are essentially uh, for uh, the uh, isolation of uh, a partner, cutting them off from all effective sources of support, um, the regulation of their behavior, uh, the uh, exploitation of, of their resources, um, and then uh, what the uh, Council of Europe in the Istanbul Convention calls the, the regulation of their everyday lives um, focused initially or primarily on how they enact those roles that women inherit by default simply because they're women, how they cook, how they clean, how they dress, and so forth, but extending across a broad gamut to some of the most trivial aspects of everyday life, whether they leave the, the bathroom open uh, or closed when they're using uh, the, the facility, um, what shows they watch on television, um, not just that they vacuum, but vacuuming till you can see the lines. Uh, and until, um, through the process of course and control, uh, the, uh, and through the process of micromanagement of women's daily lives, all of the spaces in which they might eke out and breathe the air of free persons is essentially uh, exhausted. And uh, they essentially lose that sense of being self and freedom uh, that is essential to personhood. So I know it's a very elaborate way of defining it, but I mean, it's a course of conduct. It's a course of conduct that involves a variety of tactics, and those tactics are deployed largely to subordinate uh, women. And they run the gamut uh, from violence uh, right on across to uh, uh, tactics that are only understood by the victim herself. Uh, the ultimate aim, the ultimate goal, of, I'm sorry, the ultimate effect of course of control is an experience of entrapment that can be hostage-like. Sociologically, 
The aim of coercive control, the result of coercive control, is uh, to reinforce inequality across the broad spectrum of women's life. So, Jim, what are you doing June 9th, 10th, and 11th? I, like everybody else who's into crime, I'm going to be at CrimeCon. CrimeCon 2017 is Comic-Con for crime. Mm -hmm. Real Crime Profile will be there. We will be doing a live podcast from CrimeCon 2017. So that's right. It's taking place in Indianapolis. Hopefully some of our Real Crime Profile fans can make it out and come to a live podcast. And there's a great lineup of people appearing. Our brother Tim Clementi and I will be hosting CrimeCon. We will be uh, introducing all the different celebrities and speakers that will be there. And I think there's going to be some interesting people there because not only do we have Nancy Grace, but F. Lee Bailey and actually the prosecutor from the Making a Murderer case. Oh, yes, indeed. Mr. Kratz. Yes. Mr. Kratz. Yes. It would be very interesting, very interesting to talk to him. I so, yeah, so, so check out uh, the website, www.crimecon.com, and you'll see the whole schedule. And our listeners can get 20% off the top on any tickets by using the promo code REALCRIME20, REALCRIME, the number 20. On top of that, if you go as a group, they give you a further discount as well. So it's worth looking on our Twitter feed at Real Crime Profile without the E. And we can't wait to meet you and talk to you and actually do a live podcast right from CrimeCon 2017 live. Hello, it's Jim Clementi and Francie Hakes with a special message about a new show that I'm hosting on Wondery called Locked Up Abroad. In each episode, people tell their harrowing stories of being convicted of crimes and jailed in foreign lands, or kidnapped and held hostage in war-torn countries. These are definitely worst-case, worst-case scenarios. They're truly frightening situations. Yes, no best cases here. But it is fascinating to hear how they manage to survive these ordeals. In the first episode, Midnight Express, Billy Hayes tells us about being imprisoned in Turkey for smuggling hashish. Oliver Stone even made a movie about it. But that was the movie. This is the real story. I even had the chance to interview Billy Hayes recently, and he told me the whole story behind the story of how he escaped a Turkish prison. He even told me that he went back to Turkey years later. You have to hear his story to believe it. And now, in his own words, here is Billy Hayes. Is it right to assume, perhaps that's the wrong word to use, but coercive behavior can lead on to physical abuse? Absolutely, and I mean, in most cases of domestic abuse, you, you see an escalation in, 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 in that abuse. Um, it doesn't always escalate to the point of violence, but equally some of that emotional and psychological damage can be just as harmful, if not more harmful, than physical violence. You know, some of those injuries take far, far longer to recover from. And so, going back in time, I mean, you mentioned your sort of the research that you did in, in Essex, which looked at injury levels, but at which stage? I mean, you started life as a, as a social worker, is that right? No, and I'm a sociologist. My PhD is in sociology. Sorry. Yeah, well, the thing, the thing that happened at Essex was we, we came out of that research with the then astounding finding that domestic violence was the leading cause of injury for which women sought medical attention. And we also found that it was a major cause of child abuse, a major cause of a variety of health problems that women had, alcoholism, drug abuse, homelessness, HIV disease, a variety of other problems. When I say it was a cause, what I mean is that prior to the onset of the abuse, there were no more, these, the women who ended up being abused had no more problems of these kinds than women who were not abused. In other words, the, the rates of alcoholism, the rates of drug abuse, the rates of homelessness, HIV disease were identical. So these problems only became disproportionate in the context of what was then ongoing abuse that lasted for a number of years. And so, so that was, at the time, this was very important because it meant domestic violence was the leading cause of alcohol abuse, it was the leading cause of suicidality. We demonstrated in a study of women who attempted suicide that it was the single most important uh, factor in women's suicidality. It was amazing because at that time, you know, everyone thought it was depression or a variety of other things. Right. We also demonstrated it was the most significant cause of child abuse. 45% of all the children that we studied who were uh, abused were abused by the batterer in the context of domestic violence. At the time, 
women were almost universally the ones who were blamed for child maltreatment. Mm -hmm. Men were virtually invisible in that yeah. system. I mean, in New York City, uh, even if a woman was dead, they classified the case in her name. So men were virtually invisible to the child abuse system until and written out entirely. I mean, and, and entirely, entirely. And so, so it was. It was only as a result of our research that they began to reconceptualize all of these problems in terms of violence. Now, so, and, and we did our research. When we did our research, it was unethical to ask women directly about abuse because there were no services for them. We were just starting the services. So we based our research largely on medical records, thousands of medical records that we reviewed, over 6,000 medical records, full medical records that went back 30, right. 30 40, 50 years. Um, and you were just given full access to... We to had them the at Yale. This research was done at Yale New Haven Hospital, and then the, the data was looked at, analyzed to a large extent at Essex University and, um, in Colchester, as I, you know, women home, as, as I indicated. But when we left that data, there were some really interesting questions. Um, the general theory was that if women develop mental health problems, or if they got entrapped in abusive relationships, in, in other words, the way of explaining why these relationships lasted for a number of years, why they didn't mm -hmm. just leave, it must be because the violence was so great. And there were all these theories about post-traumatic stress and you know, women being shocked into leaving and stuff. But one of the paradoxical findings in our research was that the vast, vast, vast majority of injuries that women experienced were trivial. Now, we were just looking at women's injuries because we went in through the emergency room at Yale. So all the physicality, hospital. anything physical as yeah, opposed yeah, we to were just Because that's what we thought, you know, because the women that we served in the shelter that we started, you know, they came in and what was impressive was the appalling injuries that they mm -hmm. presented. So we thought, oh, it must be injury. So where do you study injury? You go into the medical right. emergency room. Well, what it turned out, which was amazing, was that the vast, vast majority, about 95% of the uh, injured, the, of the uh, women who came in complaining of injury had very trivial injuries. You know, these were not the kinds of things that you police would get very excited about. Certainly not something that an emergency room doctor would uh, compare, for example, to people coming in with gunshot wounds and knife wounds, busy emergency room. Mm -hmm. So if there was trauma going on, it wasn't because the injuries were so severe. And that's really where our work ended, because we didn't have, but it ended with a question. Well, if the women aren't being traumatized, what is keeping them in these relationships? Now, at the time, there were all these psychobabble theories about, you know, women had learned helplessness, or they had masochistic personalities. But we knew all that was nonsense, because we could compare the women before the onset of abuse to, the, uh, uh, to women who were not abused, and they looked exactly the same psychologically. In fact, the women who ended up abused had some more positive psychological traits than the women who didn't. So all of this multi-problem profile that we were seeing was developing against the background of violence, but it wasn't bone-crushing violence. Mm. It was chronic violence, but it wasn't bone-crushing. Well, but if you say it's chronic violence, then it raises the question, what's keeping them in this relationship? And we couldn't answer that question solely by looking at medical records. So what happened next? What well, was, you know, I, I started, what happened in my system. career was that I started to get asked by prosecutors and uh, defense attorneys to get involved in cases where women, usually where women were charged with crimes, or where a man was charged with a crime against a woman uh, in the state wanted to prosecute. And so that made me start to interview women. And I mean, I had talked to women in the in the refuge that we started. We started one of the first battered women's shelters in the United States. But I didn't really talk to them about anything other than, you know, the violence they'd experienced. And again, many of them had appalling physical injuries, so there was no need to talk about anything else. And as I began to talk to women in the prisons, and as I began to develop in a forensic context, the defense of these women uh, in cases where they were charged with crimes committed in the context of the abuse or very often uh, against their abuser, homicide or other crimes, attempted homicide or robberies committed under pressure of abuse, I began to be impressed that what was most significant in their life was not necessarily the physical harm that they had suffered, but other means that these men had used to entrap them. Women started telling me stories about their money being taken. They began to tell me stories about not being allowed out of the house, of being stalked, 
not when they were separated, but within the context of uh, the family context, about threats to their children, about all kinds of uh, ways in which they have been systematically isolated, uh, kept from work or isolated at work or intimidated and so forth, running the gamut. And it quickly became clear to me that the simple concept that we had that women simply stayed out of fear needed to be complemented at the very least by understanding the ways in which women's liberty was being systematized as the freedom of movement, their, their, their freedom of choice, freedom of freedom. choice had been systematically eviscerated uh, by various forms of control which were often supported, not always, but most often supported by violence. But again, not by the bone-breaking violence. I mean, that was common enough, but it was, it, in a profile of abuse, it was relatively rare. It might be two or three incidents out of hundreds. But, but basically, that the infrastructure of violence was essentially this frequent, but mostly low-level abuse that had a cumulative effect because of its uh, existence over time, and the ways in which that violence played into and played off other forms of coercion and control that led to levels of entrapment rather than to psychological uh, dependency. In other words, at the time, there was a lot of things that women were masochistic, that they stayed with men who beat them. They you know, enjoyed big it. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. He, he loved the man who hates you or something like that. And what we showed was that there were actual structural controls over these women. If I don't have any money, if I don't have my car keys, if I am being haunted at work, if I'm being stalked when I go to the bakery, if I'm being made to be accountable for every penny I spend or call in periodically to report my whereabouts, my abuse is not a function of my psychological dependence. It's a function of the same kind of almost... Uh, slave-like existence. Mm. Micromanagement. Micromanagement. Yeah. Their lives. We call it entrapment. It's not a good word because it has other meanings. But, but the idea was that these women were being structurally imprisoned in personal life in ways that made escape increasingly difficult. So this is where the idea of coercive control came out. It, it began simply as a way of trying to explain to the criminal courts why somebody who, who wasn't necessarily facing life-threatening violence but still, nevertheless, essentially a hostage in their own home. And why, like the prisoner who's held hostage, they might wait till their, their captor fell asleep before they struck a fatal blow. They weren't going to necessarily call them out and say, you know, let's have it out right. on the carpet. You know, because they didn't have any money, they didn't have access to the car, they didn't have any of the sort of liberty rights that most people take for granted. So, so I, it, it first struck me in terms of the clients, the women that I was working with in the prison context, forensic context, and some of the men that I was seeing in, in group therapy where I was working with uh, abusive men and killers and stuff, um, I began to hear these stories about the deprivations of liberty. And as I listened to the stories women told, I realized that something very strange was going on, that even though these women were experiencing deprivations of personal rights and liberties, that would infuriate any man who suffered those things, um, that when they reacted with violence proactively to defend those liberties, they had to come up with elaborate psychological and medical psychological accounts, the battered woman syndrome or something right. like that, of why they did it. Simply saying they were defending their liberty just the way any person pursuing justice would defend their liberty wasn't enough. Which a man would have said, you yeah. know, I, I can't suffer that kind of humiliation. And the reason was, I suppose, because men started, women started off being less equal than men. And therefore, there was not, you know, if I'm going to clean a house anyway, what's the difference if I have to clean till I see the lines? And I'm punished if I don't do it. You know, if I'm going to take care of the kids anyway, what's the difference if I'm regimented in that behavior? If I cook, I have to, you know, stand beside the table while he finishes the meal. I, evidently, from what I understand, he had two bullets sitting on the mantelpiece of the apartment for a week before. So every time she'd walk by, she would see these because he had told her if she'd ever leave him, that he would kill her. So she lived in that fear, and that's why I think she, she never left. So what became clear 
was that the lack of liberty that women were experiencing, which was in plain sight when you talked to them, was invisible unless you ascribe women full status as persons. You understand what I mean? In other words, unless you assume they, they were fully entitled people, then taking away their basic right to determine how they wore their hair, or how they wore their clothes, or how they cleaned, or how they made the bed, or how, they, how high the toilet paper had to be from the floor, or what TV shows they watched, or you know, any one of them had spaces in the refrigerator that had to be filled exactly, that these kinds of coercive and controlling behaviors didn't seem strange until you posited that women have full status as persons and that in this status as per full persons, uh, forcing them to, uh, entrapping them in this way was a violation of their fundamental rights and liberties. So that, you know, so it started out basically simply as a way of explaining to the court why someone who wasn't necessarily uh, fighting for their lives would nonetheless strike a blow which for them was a blow for freedom, but which is, was interpreted very narrowly often as, uh, uh, you know, irrational or me, something like that. And if the level of violence wasn't equivalent to the level of violence that they were being subjected with, they were held accountable by the law, even though we would not have held similarly accountable any other kind of person who had become virtually a prisoner in their own family or their own in their own lives. So part of what my challenge was, was to figure out a way, conceptually, theoretically, empirically, and forensically, to explain to the court how someone uh, could be outraged by the deprivation of liberty, even though they were second-class citizens, namely women, in ways that men would automatically be assumed to be outraged by, you know, because they were more equal. Mm. So it was, there, was a, there was a sort of balance between talking about equality and inequality um, and recognizing women as full persons, because you can't understand coercive control unless you assume that women are full persons. And legally and politically, women are not full persons. Economically, they're not full persons. You know, in the States, they, you know, they make about 33 cents every dollar men make. Right. I was just listening to a debate in um, in European Parliament where an MEP stood up, uh, a member of European Parliament, and said a, a male said that women are smaller, weaker, and less intelligent, and therefore they should be paid less. And he finished up with saying, "That's all," and hit his hands on the table and sat down. And I mean, this was a couple of days ago. This was on Friday, and a, a Spanish MEP stood up, a female and just literally let him have it and said, you know, I am here representing women who need protection from people <coughs> like you. And, you know, and people started clapping. <coughs> but whilst you still have that in, you know, that way, he said it out loud. I mean, this wasn't well, something that was invisible. You know, invisible. the reason, look, apart from bias, which is systematic in all of our societies, the reason women can be paid less than men is because they can survive on less than men. I mean, because women are capable of running their household and cooking for themselves. You don't have to pay them a wage that covers a woman's work, you know, which is essentially what you pay men. I mean, classically, that's the, that's the answer, that you pay people what it costs to reproduce their labor power. Obviously, you can't pay women less than it costs to reproduce their labor power or they wouldn't be able to come to work. So it's because women are more self-sufficient than men. As they become less and less self-sufficient, You'll have to raise their wages a little bit, but but of course a lot of it is just sexist bias. That women mm -hmm. are still second-class citizens. A lot of it has to do with the sex segregation of women's labor. But I think the broader issue for us was that um, it was very difficult to see that coercive control was a very basic violation of women's liberty rights and democracy rights unless you ascribe to women the full status of persons with the same rights to liberty that anybody else had, and also. Remember, these violations of liberty were violations of things that most of us took for granted. They weren't things that you could easily find in the Constitution. Mm. So if I tell you you have to vacuum until you can see the lines, what liberty right am I violating? I'm violating your autonomy, clearly. But do I have a right to do that as a husband? Um, you know, if I take your money out of your pocketbook, you know, and, and you're a stranger on the, on the tube or on the subway, that's a, that's a criminal offense. That's burglary or robbery. If I use, you know, if I use any kind of violence or force to do it, I take your money out of your pocketbook in the kitchen. There's no criminal act involved. Many of these things 
were crimes only when they were committed against strangers. Some of them were criminal behaviors like stalking, which nobody was enforcing when it occurred in relationships. Others of these behaviors, and in some ways the most interesting of these behaviors that we began to identify and describe, um, were behaviors which only became impactful in terms of entrapping women in combination with the coercion uh, and other forms of control. So for example, there's nothing inherently criminal about telling someone they have to vacuum until you can mm. see the lines. It only becomes criminal when if they don't vacuum to see, with the or else provides no hanging in the air. So that's what we were trying to show that, or I was trying to show the courts, and then more and more trying to gather data on that, and, that what was happening in these relationships, which we had thought really were only uh, the only significant event was violence, and you could understand them through the prism of violence. And so the primary harm that we were looking at was physical injury, obviously, and maybe some psychological, uh, emotional damage. Now what we were looking at were the abrogation of basic rights, rights that were so fundamental that for most of us men, and probably for millions of women, they were just taken for granted. They were invisible. The violations were invisible. You know, um, so, so we were trying to bring these violations up by showing their combination with a range of uh, coercive behaviors and then to highlight the liberty interests that women and society in general had in responding. Yeah, and I remember, I mean, I started my research of looking at the, through the prism of murder, domestic violence murder, and then doing lots of interviews with women too and hearing, funnily enough, exactly what you just said uh, right at the start, which, you know, a lot of women saying the physical stuff, the bruises and the bones, that's not the worst stuff, you know, the breaks. And, you know, the worst stuff is actually all the psychological and you can't put a bandage around it, no one can see it. But, you know, the bruises will fade, the bones will mend. And, you know, that's some of the, my thinking started to turn from standing in classrooms with police officers and saying to them domestic abuse is a pattern and explaining cases and saying that, you know, you've got to look for all the psychological, the coercion and showing them the power and control will and them nodding and getting it. Um, you know, normally police learn by talking about cases. If you can hang what your framework on a case, um, but the challenge always came when they left the classroom and the 999 call comes in and they were going out to respond to the incident and looking for the physical evidence to back up um, and corroborate what's being said. And of course, that's where it all started to yeah. fall down. I wouldn't use the, I, I, don't, I hesitate to use the word psychological because I think it implies uh, much, um, it, it implies that um, it misses the structural elements. So 54% of the women we're seeing have their money taken away from them. If your money's taken away from you, your dependence is not psychological. Your dependence is literal, it's structural. Very real. Yeah. It's structural. No, but, and the point you're making about police is very, very important because now um, uh, what we're telling police uh, in training them under the new course of controlling behavior offense in England is um, what I tell them when I'm training them is don't just take a picture. By picture, I don't mean a picture necessarily of the woman. I mean a picture of the uh, environment, surroundings. Don't necessarily take a picture, open a window. And the reason I say open a window is because you can walk into a family situation where there's minimal injury, and uh, yet you have a hostage-like course of control taking place. That takes place in the context of uh, hostage-like course of control. We just had a case, um, uh, I think it was the Wallaby case uh, here, uh, where all the guy did was he poured paint on the uh, family machinery in, in the family factory because his wife wouldn't let him loan him money to buy marijuana. And the police went in. They were smart enough to see that as a prison to go into the family under the new course of the controlling behavior offense. And they found she had two years of photographs on her cell phone of assaults. They found that he was controlling every element of her life. And the guy ended up getting four and a half years in prison, charged with the new offense. Under the old regime of domestic violence regime, he wouldn't have gotten anything. He might have gotten a small fine and maybe a, a, a stay away wrist. order, yeah. you know, something like that. If that, because the crime was basically vandalism. So it wouldn't have been connected necessarily to course of control at all. So, so essentially what we've been trying to work with police uh, around is very difficult because they do have the protection of harassment law, and thanks in part to you, the stalking amendment, and 
you know, other mm -hmm. work that's been done. 2012. But, but the harassment, in the Harassment Act 2012, unfortunately, was limited to estranged parties. And one of the interesting things is even though the uh, uh, Attorney General, Mr. Buckland, uh, uh, Solicitor General, uh, Buckland, Robert Buckland, Buckland used the pretext uh, in proposing the new coercive and controlling behavior offense of extending the stalking law to uh, intact couples, no one, so far as I know, has actually been charged with stalking under the new offense which is strange because that was its intention. Um, and, and the whole idea was to recognize that stalking is a continuum of behaviors that begins uh, in abusive relationship. When it begins in abusive relationships, about 40% of the time, uh, the stalking is already well established before the couple separates. Um, no, in the majority of cases, the stalking is well established. And so one of the real challenges we've had with the new offense is what I consider a very um, ill thought out separation of stalking in relationships from the, from the same relationship now when the couple is separated, charging under a different offense, the Protection from Harassment Act stalking. Um, it's the same couple, it's the same continuity of behavior, it's just now they're together, now they're separated and we're going to charge them with separate offenses. So but I you can charge them, them with both, and that's how... Well, that that's, hasn't happened, not once. But that's how we, we wrote it. Yeah, but and that hasn't that's, happened. That, no, but that that's a train, that is a training issue, and so the... But it shouldn't be one, it shouldn't be both. It should be a single stalking offense, because once you, once you charge it with both, you run into all sorts of complications of evidencing one offense and evidencing the other offense separately, well, what you're looking for, what you're looking at is a single course of conduct. So I'm jumping in here at a critical point of Evan and I debating as we're splitting this interview into two parts. Just to pick up on the last point that Evan made, we did in fact campaign for a single offence of stalking. This was what we wanted with a maximum of 10 years sentence. However, the Home Office lawyers advised that the Protection from Harassment Act would be amended. And no doubt that was in part because it was quicker and cheaper, but it does have some unintended consequences. And one of those unintended consequences is that the criminalisation gap was further highlighted and emphasised. The other gap, of course, was that it meant that the maximum sentence was five years rather than ten years, and we have just campaigned successfully for that to be amended to ten years. So it was obvious in this case that domestic violence law reform was required in order to close this gap, and this was due to the stalking law reform campaign, as well as due to the cases that we are advising and advocating for at Paladin, along with conversations with many victims who told me that the abuse and the coercive control was the worst part, and also through reviews of murders where non-physical abuse was not seen as relevant to the escalating pattern of risk, nor was there an arrest or com prosecution and conviction. And then I read a fascinating paper by Professor Deborah Twerkheimer, a former prosecutor, and the paper was called 51 Breakups. So along with working with Evan and reading this paper, my thoughts began to clarify and really did solidify. And Deborah was a critical advisor to me in the domestic violence law reform campaign with Sarah Charlton Foundation and Women's Aid. If you're interested in this paper, you can find it on Paladin's website, and ostensibly it highlighted that patterns of controlling behaviours were legally permitted when a couple were together. Yet they were illegal once we had changed the law on stalking, if and only if the couple separated. This seemed crazy to me. How could it be that the cumulative harm and behaviours in the same relationship were missed time and time again? And the laws used to prosecute domestic violence, including breaches of restraining order, damaging property, burglary assault, rape, kidnapping and murder, missed its very essence. It missed the fact that coercive control is about fear and a pattern of continuing acts. And that's what we set about changing, as no one was going to prison without injuries being present. And we'd also pioneered the stalking law, thus creating a framework to show proof of concept. We set this against the backdrop of what victims were telling us and we put victims' voices at the centre of the campaign. Overwhelmingly, but not surprisingly, 98% said that law reform was needed. So just to contextualise that further, building on what Evan said, 94% said that the coercive control was the worst part, 88% said the controlling behaviour was not taken into account by the police, 
and 98% said that coercively controlling behaviour was present. And just to give you an idea of the types of behaviours that they described, they told us about things like isolation, that they were being isolated from friends, family and colleagues, excessive jealousy, removal of phones, laptops and iPads, withholding food or the use of the toilet, control over what they could wear and how they'd wear their hair, financial control, being tracked and made to account for their time and their whereabouts, sleep deprivation, threats to sexually harm and rape, threats to harm them physically, strangle them and harm others that they cared about. Threats to harm the children were also common. So if you're interested, you can read the Victims' Voice survey on the Paladin website, www.paladinservice.co.uk. The other key point to emphasise from the conversation with Evan and I is also that behaviours and abuse are not always easy to identify, as they can be covert and dressed up as pseudo-caring behaviour, for example. I've sadly seen this in many cases, and Evan mentioned the case of Nicole Brown Simpson that we discussed on Real Crime Profile, and also Reva Steenkamp and Helen Bailey and the controversial West Town. Perpetrators can be very adept at manipulating and turning the tables and lens on the victim. Equally, 52% of victims don't see themselves as being victimised or controlled as they think it's about physical abuse only. And I remember the case that I wrote a report on for court, the case of Natalie Isaac, who was sadly stalked and murdered in Kent. She ironically saw him as the victim as he turned everything around on her and she kept trying to help him despite the abuse. That's why training, education and awareness raising is so important. That concept of opening the window that Evan spoke about and the DASH risk assessment model really helps structure the conversation with victims and half the questions are actually about coercive control. If you're interested in knowing and learning more about that, I'm running a training session on coercive control on October the 10th, having advised on the law and the statutory guidance with the Home Office. And there's also a DASH Masterclass on September the 28th and Train the Trainer on October the 3rd. So you can go to the DASH Risk Checklist website or email jenny at laurarichards.co.uk. So we're going to leave it there for the first instalment of the pod, but don't forget to tune in next week to hear part two with the fascinating Professor Evan Stark. This is Real Crime Profile, and thank you so much for listening. So if you enjoy our podcast and would like to support us, there are a couple of important things you can do. First, you can go over to iTunes and give us a positive five-star review. You can check out our sponsors and take advantage of the special promotions for Real Crime Profile listeners. You can go over and like our Facebook page and you can follow us on Twitter. But most importantly, you can share our podcast with friends, family and anyone you know would be interested in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. So thank you for listening. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineered by Terrell Parham. Music composed by Simba Zumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107 or you can go on the website www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic violence, call the National Domestic Violence Helpline free phone 0800 2000 247. In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, safety, shelter or counselling, call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, 214-946-4357 or go on their website, www.genesisshelter.org or the domestic violence hotline on 800-799-7233.